This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Andrew Bins, who is the co-founder of Change Logic, which is a firm that helps companies to become the kinds of organizations that we're going to talk about for the next hour or so. And he's also the co-author of this book called Corporate Explorer, How Corporations Beat Startups at the Innovation Game. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Greg. And I love the title of your podcast, Unsiloed. It makes me feel like I'm in one of those unplugged concerts with my acoustic guitar. <laughs> yeah, well, it's called Unsiloed because I'm interested in exploring when do we have trade-offs and when do we not have trade-offs? You know, when can we overcome these trade-offs? And indeed, this is the topic of your book, this idea of explore versus exploit. I think it was James March that came up with this concept way back but it's really been brought into the business literature by your two co-authors, Charles O'Reilly and Michael Tushman, who have come up with this idea of the ambidextrous organization, right? Which is one that somehow manages <laughs> to do both explore and exploit. And going all the way back to Schumpeter, I think the idea was that you got to pick, you got to be one or the other, you got to be oil or water. You can't do both at the same time. And of course, this is Schumpeter's explanation. I mean, he, he, he says, you know, all great innovation comes from new firms and the old firms are just there to kind of, you know, live off yesterday's innovations. And I think even though you guys are trying to help companies figure out how to avoid that dichotomy, well, that still seems to be the dominant phenomenon, right? In corporate world. So not to summarize the entire hour into one sentence, but how do we get over this? I mean, this trade-off has been around for an awfully long time. And then it will forever be around, Greg. You've landed on the right place, right? Which is that there's a part of this, which is about business and innovation and organizations and all these kinds of things. But there's also a big part of this, which is cognitive psychology. How do we cope as human beings with the reality of the complexity of the world. And there's no question, some people deal with that reality by trying to make it really simple. We see that just a little bit in the political world at the moment, right? I'm British, and we sure as hell saw this with this colossal self-harm of Brexit. This is like, let's make out like the world's really simple. And we don't have to make any trade-offs or deal with any inconveniences in order to prosper, right? And in a sense, that's the same, right? That you want to believe that you can just do one thing in corporations, that everything will conform to your existing business model, and you won't have to deal with the awkwardness of doing two sometimes contradictory things simultaneously. Because the consequences of doing two things simultaneously in an organization can be quite difficult. There's no question we can talk more about that. And I think that the part of this notion of the ambidextrous organization is how do you configure an organization in such a way that it enables it to deal with these complexities? And that, yeah, and that, and corporate explorer, and then I'm pleased to say we have coming later in the year, the Corporate Explorer field book, is taking that theoretical, analytical, academic analysis of the situation and breaking it down. Who does this? How do you actually do it? Practically, where does it happen in the world? It is a lot to do with how do you live in complexity? How do you live in contradiction? Well, you know, I teach a course on strategy and well, actually I call it now strategic leadership because, you know, there's so much leadership involved and it oftentimes that is more important than understanding the strategy piece. But, you know, you mentioned that you require individuals to master both exploration and exploitation. But at some level, part of your recipe for success involves a separation, right? And involves a division of labor within the organization. Do you have to have, in order to have a organization that successfully navigates both of these worlds, do we have to have a line that is split down within the brains of every single person in the organization? Or is it really only at the highest levels that you have to be able to deal with this complexity? And then, you know, the foot soldiers are either going to be in the explore camp and the exploitation camp. I think and this is one of those sort of areas where disagreement you know, rages, as there is definitely a point of view that 
we can give people 10% or 20% of their time to go and explore new areas. And that is what、well, they call it contextual ambidexterity. And I have to tell you that I just think there's, that there are just really weak facts on this side. And I don't say that because I spend a lot of time poring over academic studies on it. I'm afraid I don't. What I do is I look at the examples that exist in the world. And I look at the experience that I get told by colleagues, by people I work with. And the two great examples we have in the world are 3M and Google. And what we observe is that these are both phenomenally successful innovation organizations that have kind of lost their way. And part of the explanation for that is that they haven't tackled this issue because that I can do innovation in a percentage of my time. Works in one part of a growth curve, right? And when you're early growth curve, that's what you do. And also, if you're in an R&D led innovation mentality, but most firms can't get to the future through simply technical innovation. We've got to think about how are we delivering not just hardware but software. We've got to think about how are we bringing on services because one of the things that's happened in the world is that people have figured out the value lies in the people who integrate things in front of the consumer and deliver that sort of differential value, like the people who make this little black box of a phone. Right? It is that actually they solve problems for us. Well, if you're going to solve problems for us, you've got to think differently. It's no longer just a technical world. It's Also, a customer world, and that requires something completely different in the way that you innovate than this contextual stuff. And yeah, I do think that you need to think about how do you separate function. It's not the only thing that you do. It's really significant point, Greg, is that there are a number of ways to pursue your innovation goals and your growth goals. Doing your ventures inside a corporation is one of those. And happens to be, I think, really important and successful. But there are also some other things that you need alongside it. You talk about the academic discussions of ambidexterity. There's some guy out there who insists that dual innovation is in some way superior and different. And now we've got someone else who talks about somebody reached out to me the other day about multidextrous. No, it's not the point, guys. The point is. As you've identified, that explore and exploit, or core and explore, as I prefer to term it, just to, for reasons we can discuss, that these are different logics, right? And the explore, you're going to do lots of different explorations, and what you've got to get is this logic is different than the continue to drive for operational effectiveness, for profit, for delivering with stability. You've got to deliver. With instability, right? deliver with many experiments with uncertainty. That's the point of this, and that is why it's ambidextrous, right? That's why it's two things at once. It doesn't mean you only do two things. Well, look, I mean, you talk about the global innovation industry, yes, and it's a real thing. I'm part of it. I've seen it. I'm swimming in it out here in California. I think it's one of our biggest exports. <laughs> That's true. Yes,、right? and we've got people flying in from all over. Maybe a little bit less since COVID, who come here to figure out, right? That's right. From all over the world, yeah, it's a really significant point. Japan, Germany. I mean, I've gone with clients, other parts of the U.S. Everybody wants to come to Silicon Valley to sort of. Feel the air, feel what's in the water that teaches them how to innovate. And, and I think you know it's been partially successful. I love how you、oh, break things down into these three stages, right? You talk about ideating, incubating, and scaling. And you know, I independently arrived at kind of a three-stage process in my teaching, where I talk about idea generation, idea evaluation, and idea execution. And I think with respect to the first one, idea generation, the global innovation industry has, I think, done a fairly good job of kind of teaching people how to generate ideas. Right? I mean, this is like the design thinking approach, right? And sometimes I'll have these folks come out with CEO and their team, and the CEO will be. My people don't have any ideas. They just got their nose to the grindstone, and then we'll run them through one of these design workshops, and they'll be like, "Oh!" And then you know, I'll get a call two weeks later, like. What have you done? Stop it! Shut it off! <laughs> And so I always like to talk about how organizations get idea constipation because the ideas, like they, they go in, but then they never go out. And you point out that it's the amount of attention that's been given on kind of the education and training side is huge at the front end, but not a lot has been delivered to the back end. Now, is that simply because 
the folks who are in the global innovation industry think that, oh, the VCs will magically take care of everything after that, right? I mean, it's targeting entrepreneurs rather than thinking seriously about how these organizations sort of throttle the ideas or fail to act on them. So I think there's three explanations for this idea zoo, innovation zoo, that we find ourselves in within corporations sometimes. The first one is that it's intensely compelling. The people who walk into your workshops, the reason they come up with so many ideas is it's an exciting moment of liberation. This is really something, and there's some good cognitive psychology research that I quote in the book about just how addictive ideas are to the human brain, right? That search for possibilities for opportunity. The second reason, I think, is that so much of the innovation practice within corporations, at least, is informed by startups. And for startups, there is a lot of focus on ideation, on idea generation, and creating possibilities, and then funding those possibilities to see how they unfold. And they export the problem of scaling. And they export it to corporates. And I think the more over the last 20, 30 years, Silicon Valley has developed, it's really optimized that model itself. It's moving up the S-curve, and it's learning how to optimize itself around the exit to a corporate. I mean, this is how I think of open innovation now, right? Open innovation is like, let's outsource our R&D, right? And we'll watch all these startups do their thing. And then, and I mean, I remember one time I went to Google, and it wasn't that long ago, we had some ideas around educational stuff. And we were saying, hey, why don't you do this? And they were like, eh, we'll wait and see. And if some startup does it well, we'll just acquire them. (laughs) Really? Even within Google? Yeah. And I think, so then the third reason is ideas matter. There's a dimension to which these are all incredibly important and good things to do, right? It's just you get caught by the other two reasons as to why we end up spending so much time on ideation. So I'm not knocking ideation. It's hugely important. But I do think, and I'd be interested in your view of this, Greg, is I feel like we're moving from, if you're in a corporate world, you're moving from an epoch where the dominant philosophy of innovation is R&D-led and where you generate ideas and then you find commercialization. And we're now in a world where that's not the way around you do it. You start with what's a market that's attractive? What's an area we want to play in? And where are the problems that we want to solve? And then when we've got a problem that is big enough and interesting enough and valuable enough, then we'll go find an idea to help solve it. And that is the sort of the way round we need to think about innovation. It's quite different. And I think our assumptions are quite deeply in this model one. Even my own. I look at one of the I was looking at one of the charts we used the other day. I'm like, wait a minute, this is this we're still in the old model of generation of ideas first. And it's not the point. And I think if you look at, so one of my favorite corporate explorers who's not in the book, because I've met her after we published, is Yoki Matsuoka. And Yoki's down the road from you. She was with the founding team of Nest, the thermostat, then to Google Nest. And she spent time at Apple. And she's now at Panasonic. And at Panasonic, she was given the opportunity to build a new business. And her view was not, hey, how can I build AI platforms? How can I do a technology-led innovation? No, her whole mentality was, let's go and find a really important customer problem to solve. And she landed on the problem of overworked families unable to cope with daily tasks and has built this solution called Johanna to help meet those needs, which is like an AI-enabled concierge service. That's like a world-class technical innovator, MIT, PhD, MacArthur Foundation winner. You know, this woman is unimpeachable as a technical innovator. That's not the way she's doing it. And I think that's the switch that corporations need to learn and to make really firmly in across their operations. Yeah. So I've heard this shift referred to as a shift from product centricity to customer centricity, right? Like where you cook up some product and then you go and figure out who you can sell it to versus you've already got some connection to the customer. You're already kind of harvesting data from the customer. And then that means you can see their pain points. And, you know, it seems like corporations have a huge advantage compared to startups because with startups, we always say like the first step is you got to get something out in front of the customer so you can start seeing 
you know, how they behave and you know, what are their pain points are. But, you know, if you're a company that already has customers, like presumably you are already in a primo position because you've got a little spy on the wall, like watching them, right? If you just open your eyes and master the observation stage, then you should be generating all sorts of potential new solutions by just observing the customers you have at your disposal. That's the opportunity. Yeah, right there. And of course, AI makes some of this really possible now as well. But it's tough to learn. I'm working with a hospital system and there's this is on running tension. They want to build new ventures. They want to create new revenue streams because hospitals post pandemic are really in a really tough situation in this country, just like they are globally. And they want something tangible. And they keep asking me, what are the key deliverables we will have in this product? What will we be selling at the end of it? And like, I don't know, because we start with the premise of, you know more about your customers' pain points than anybody else, because you have all of these clinical data, you have all this customer NPS data and, and insight, and that's what you're going to mine to be able to discover what is it that if you were solving for them would be valuable. And you should be surprised. There should be some serendipity in that process. You didn't have it confirming what you've always known. You should learn. And then you decide what ideas you want to go to. But the drive to the tangible, the drive to the specific is you know, really difficult to resist. I think of the startup world as it's kind of like the US and corporations are like Venezuela. We're not endowed with a lot of great oil but we managed to suck a whole lot more value out of our rather meager supply of oil in Venezuela, which is just swimming in oil, right? They can't seem to get much out of it. And so, you know, these VCs are capable of driving the ideas to the next level. And so could you talk a bit about, we always bash the old stage gate process, right? Because it tries to eliminate all the risk before moving forward. I talk about this as using the net present value approach as opposed to like the VC approach. Why is that? Tell us how that approach has worked historically and why it's been so detrimental to the emergence of ideas within companies. Yeah. And we see this in many corporations, sometimes, sometimes often, if we're asked in to evaluate, we have this innovation program, but we're not generating the results that we like. So some corporations ask us to come in and sort of look at what they might do to improve. And it's pretty common that the issue is that they still have the stage gate process in place. And the reason why it works, the reason why it's so important is because it gives you a way of making these key decisions about how to add features and functionality to a product in a methodical way and to really connect all of the pieces of the organization, all of the silos of the organization around delivering a good customer outcome. So it, it adds tremendous value inside the organization. The challenge is that, as you mentioned, is that it's premised on the idea of eliminating uncertainty as early as possible. And the thing that we know about innovation is you need to hold open your ability to learn and see multiple possibilities. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. One of our case studies in Corporate Explorer is this guy, Balaji Bondilli at Deloitte, building a new model for doing professional services using the crowd. And you know, what's really important for Balaji is that he never fully commits. Well, never. He waits a long time before he fully commits what the product is. It's something to do with the crowd. He can bring crowd labor to solve problems for Deloitte clients. Okay, that's interesting. But how about if he changes the whole labor model within the business? You know, he plays with that. And then the pandemic comes along and blesses him with good fortune of a tremendous need to be able to blend other forms of talent with Deloitte's consulting you know, full-time consultants. So he gets lucky in a way, but that's kind of innovation, right? You keep options open and then you find what works because events teach you and the pandemic may be a particular kind of accelerator, but it's, it is what happens. And so the other example would be this guy, Francesco Storace at NL, the Italian energy company. And Mike Tushman has just written this fabulous case study, which is well worth reading, of what Storace has done over the decade at NL. And he starts in NL Green Power. 
And he is given the job of go create a wholly new way of generating electricity that is, you know, carbon neutral. And he's urged by many people, for goodness sake, manage your resources wisely and just choose a couple of these things, wind power, solar power, geothermal, hydro, blah, blah, you know, on and on and on, different possibilities. He says, no, I want to look at all of them. I want to have projects in 10 and I want to find out which one is going to meet our needs. And until I've learned which one's really going to satisfy our problem, I can't make a selection. I can't narrow my choices. And ultimately, he does choose wind in particular which we then they've had amazing success in Italy with adopting renewables because of this. And so this keeping options open is really important. This is what I call incubate, right, where you've got to learn. And the trouble with stage gate is it forces you to drive to conclusions far too soon. And it's well-intentioned, it's meaningful. But when you look at the ventures in corporations who are applying it in new domains, what you find is that they de-risk the innovation to be something completely inconsequential. That were you to do it and be successful, you're like, yes, yeah, so what? Does it make a difference? And this is the problem. It doesn't scale to an ambition of the opportunity. And this is what startups do better than corporations. It's one of the things that I think is really important that we learn is that you've got to pursue your innovation to the scale of the opportunity, the scale of the market, not to the scale of what you think you can get past your manager or what you can squeeze through the stage gate process, right? That is exactly how exploit or core business logic kills the explore in corporate innovation. Well, it, it's confusing because when we think about the reasons why venture capitalists are so successful is because they too use some kind of staging process, right? They stage the finance. What they do is twofold, and I teach this in my venture capital classes, is on the one hand, you want to push the decision-making further out until you uh, get the information that you need, but you also are aggressively trying to accelerate the arrival of information, right? So you're trying to pull information into the present and push decision-making out into the future. And it's that second part, right, about pulling information into the present, which we sometimes refer to as, you know, the lean startup approach. And the lean startup approach has pretty much taken over the startup world. So why is it so hard to get organizations to bake in experimentation and bake in kind of this lean startup approach and well, it seems to me like that is a process for de-risking investment as well. And so it seems like such a no-brainer. Why is it so hard to get it through the corporate decision-making? Yeah, it is a vexing problem. And I should say, let me, let me just be clear, my book, Corporate Explorer, is subtitled How Corporations Beat Startups at Innovation. I think you said you've had my colleague, your colleague, Charles O'Reilly from Stanford and Chase Logic on your podcast. And Charles and Mike Tushman from Harvard, they tell the same story. But I think they start with the bad news story, with just how hard it is to escape the clutches of organizational inertia. And this is true. But mine is also a good news story. How do you overcome these issues? And one of the things you need to do is to teach senior executives how to live in this world of experimentation. There's no reason why they are blessed with knowing. I was talking to a CEO yesterday, and I asked him about this. And he was trying to wrestle with it. And at some point, he was like, you know what, I don't really know what you're talking about, Andy. I don't really understand this notion of experimentation and testing and learning. This is not the background as a corporate executive that I've had. But as we talked about it, he said, yeah, one of the most important moments in my career was when a manager said, you know what, you've had 10 out of 10 successful, he's in retail, store launches. And that just shows me that you're not working hard enough to stretch your boundaries. You should have failed more. And he said, huh. And he started to connect these two thoughts together. And that's the kind of thing you need to do with senior executives is teach them how do they learn to work with experimentation techniques in a way that is going to advance them? And I think the way is kind of almost to embrace this notion of risk aversion, right? We're always running away. Oh, they're so risk averse. We've got to embrace that because actually within it is something very important. And you referenced it. It's this notion of de-risking. And you start 
your conversations around an innovation, not with how brilliant it is and how fantastic it's going to be and how it's going to have a hockey stick growth curve, but rather with what are the big risks? What are the big assumptions that you need to test? What are the things that will allow you to get there? And I think sometimes corporate innovators hide those too much, right? Instead of making them really loudly up there and say, now let's talk about how we're going to manage some of those. So I think that this is a fundamentally important thing is to re reorient ourselves in terms of how we engage in talking about the topic of risk. Because one thing is for sure, in a traditional corporate career, you do not get rewarded by saying, I don't know. <laughs> right? That is countercultural. So unless you take it head on, it's hard to make progress. Well, I mean, now you're talking about kind of career risk. And one thing is about the organization risking some capital and some resources. But the book is called Corporate Explorer because I think it's about people, right? And it's about individuals within the organization that have to kind of assume this role. And it's meant to be an inspiring guide, right? Giving people the courage to become these explorers within the organization. But I mean, how do you take away that element of career risk? If you do a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, right? And your startup fails, you are unemployed. You've got, you got to go and find something else to do with your life, right? But the kind of people who are attracted to organizations they're thinking about promotion and stuff. And on the one hand, we want to say it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. At the end of the day, right, if entrepreneurs are willing to confront that risk, shouldn't our internal explorers be willing to confront that risk? And could we ever get them to embrace that if the outsized payoffs are not there? What happens if you are successful? Best case scenario, you get a little bonus and pat on the back and you know, employee of the month and maybe you know the chance to do it again. Yeah, so... This, that's a lot in your question there, Greg. Where shall I start? I will start with that when we look at the corporate explorers who succeeded, a few really interesting facts emerge. Almost none of them have differential compensation schemes, and yet they still build multi-billion dollar corporate entities inside existing corporations, right? So what's up with that? Secondly, they are mostly insiders with more than a decade of tenure within the corporations within which they do this. And thirdly, those that do succeed do have some pretty successful careers. Right? I mentioned Francesco Starace. He goes from leading this green energy thing, which is treated like aliens from another planet within NL, and he becomes CEO of the whole corporation. Or Jim Peck, at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, starts this little venture. He goes, ends up being CEO of that, and now is on his third gig as CEO, right? So these individuals can have pretty successful careers as executives. It's a great way, actually, to fast track yourself through your career. It's certainly a path that's there. But for all of that success, I think you're making a serious and important point. This career risk is really the reason why both corporate explorers don't act, or well, I suppose it's the same point now thinking about it, it's what they see is when a corporate explorer leaves, that sends a message to the organization, right? And I've had a corporate explorer leave their corporation the last couple of years, and the innovation continued. And I know it isn't entirely because he was deemed to have failed and all the rest of it. And the CEOs told me, boy, I wish I could get him back. He was so great and blah, blah, blah. But it's too late. He's gone. And you do need to protect them and hold them because it is important, these messages that you send in the organization, that somebody who does something new, what happens to them. Uh, so I think that's a real point of vulnerability. And it is something that's on the mind of corporate explorers all the time, right? Particularly those who are the ones that come up from within. No question. A lot of my time is just spent talking to them about that, how they're going to manage it and so on. You say that corporate explorers, they can't be consensus seekers, right? And that oftentimes they're a bit lonely. But just like regular entrepreneurs, they have to be fighting tooth and nail for access to resources, right? Access to funding, access to the customers and so forth. And this means that they're asking other people in the organization to spend time, energy, and resources on something which will presumably come at the expense of what they're being evaluated for, right? So how can they 
on the one hand, to get these other people to make these sacrifices when the, the organization and the KPIs and everything that, that those people are working for are going to suffer. So there's a couple of answers to that question, Greg, because it's clearly really one of those sort of key success factors as to, because part of our work here is we know that 90% struggle and it's only about, to, well, even the 10% that succeed still struggle, right? It's hard, but no matter what. Well, I mean, that's the hit rate for startups, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If it's worth it, then it's good. So there's a few things about this. The most important thing that I observe about these successful corporate explorers is that they have relatively low egos, and they figure out how to make many people in the organization think it was their idea. And isn't it great that Greg is pursuing my idea? You know, I helped to make him successful at this. I've literally had people say this to me, right? So my favorite corporate explorer, I shouldn't have favorites, but one of my favorite corporate explorers who I start the book with is Christian Kurtish in Hungary. And what I love about this example is that Christian is not at the top of the organization. He's in a small business unit, right? A country within a business unit of the overall corporation. And he's been there a long time. He's chief actuary within the Hungarian business of Unica, which is a like six and a half billion revenue, 20,000 people insurance company headquartered in Vienna. And the Viennese are very nice, but there's a long history between Vienna and Budapest, obviously, and the whole Austro-Hungarian empire. And for the most part, Budapest is down there, right? And he is going to pop up with this radical idea for how to reinvent insurance as a digital-only monthly subscription, pay your claims in two days, no questions asked, slash the administration costs to a fraction, like you know, you're talking less than 5% of the cost of administering an existing policy. He's like tearing the model apart, right? Now, he doesn't just walk into the CEO's office and say, hey, this is how I'm going to do it. He has to build a network of support. He needs allies, people who he can persuade to see the world the same way. And he doesn't go to them and say, hey, I've got this great idea. He says, ha, huh, do you see the problem like this? Do you see that we've got disconnected from our customers, that insurance started as a risk-sharing community and it's become this kind of a policy administration engine, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we need a way of dealing with that. And he needs advocates, people who understand when things go wrong, right? Because in large organizations, bad news travels really fast and the reputation of the corporate explorer can undermine their success. So he needs those advocates who know the story and are willing to defend them. And he needs angels just like anybody. He needs a senior sponsor who's willing to commit resources. And I often challenge corporate explorers as they're getting started or if they're struggling with this. How much time have you spent analyzing who those people are and building an influence plan for them? If you contrast the approach that they take, which is almost always casual and unstructured, with what an entrepreneur does, right? They're going to go up and down Sand Hill Road raising capital. They're going to pull from Crunchbase all of the different funding that the VC has done, what kind of themes they fund in, what companies they've backed, which ones worked, why, what schools their daughter goes to, you know, where they shop, their shoe size, the whole thing, right? And you don't do that in a corporate explorer. And my question is, why not? That's your investor base. You've got to treat them with the same degree of rigor, or at least some of the same degree of rigor, because you've got to find the motivation that they have, the reason they want to invest in you, and how you make it so that they feel a part of your idea rather than having to say yes or no to this sort of slightly manic person with a wild-eyed idea and great enthusiasm. And contrast that. I had a guy call me up recently. He was a corporate explorer at the firm, and he was now trying to get his innovation going in a different way. And he wanted to tell me how what I'd written in the book was impossible and what was I smoking and all the rest of it. And he said, yeah, well, I had a great way of dealing with those guys from corporate. I made sure that the uh, badge reader into our part of the building only worked for us and none of them. So they couldn't even come anywhere near us. That sends a very clear message about what he thinks of the rest of the corporation. And that ain't no way to succeed. And, you know, you talk about unsiloed, there's a degree to which corporate explorers need to be really firmly wedded to their mission, no question, and have autonomy. But they need a social network, this movement inside the organization to get things going. And then if they have a CEO who has a bold ambition 
that creates a context in which they can innovate, then that's even more important, even more empowering, I think. Yeah, I talked to Michael Arena about this, and he talks a bit about how there's a top-down way to make sure that the corporate explorers have protectors right, to keep the immune system at bay. But I love this analogy between the corporate explorer and the founder in this sense. And I think it's not just about investors, it's about advisors, right? I'm an advisor and an accelerator here at Berkeley, and it's remarkable. It always amazes me how much effort advisors will put into advising these startups without any kind of equity component at all. One of the things that makes for a great accelerator is it's the advisor network. And these are folks that are just dedicated to helping out. And we have that phrase, you know, if you want money, ask for advice, right? So that's a slogan that everybody says, you know, you don't ask for money, you ask for advice and then the money will come. But who is actually providing the real money, like the budget? Who acts as the VC within the organization? Because we know the CFO doesn't, right? The CFO is not generally in a, in a good position to figure out whether these internal founders are doing well. And you talk about these metrics. I'd love if you could dig into the metrics for a second, because the metrics that we use to evaluate incremental innovation or success within a exploit part of the organization are very different. And you talk about these feed forward control. Could you dig into that a bit? Because that, I think, without a metric, I don't think that you can ever really develop a coherent system for allocating capital and other resources. I agree completely. And I think that's exactly the way to think about it is that whether you like it or not, you are in competition with other ways of deploying capital. And, you know, that somebody's got to make a decision. Is this the right way to deploy it? Now, there is more than a financial return at stake, right? Your Balaji Bondilli is doing Deloitte Pixel in order to help solve a problem for Deloitte overall. Francesco Starace is doing something to help move NL and Italy into a new world, or Best Buy is building Best Buy Health with Deborah DeSanzi because they see the opportunity to leverage their assets to create a more diversified revenue base. So it's not purely the straight up financial rewards that you're measuring, but you do need to be accountable. Innovators need to take accountability more seriously, I think, than sometimes they do. And it's because corporations only have one system of accountability, which is feedback control. Have you met your plan? If you've not met your plan, let's do error control on what you need to change in order to get back to plan, because we know how that system functions. Now, feed forward is we want to go here. We don't quite know how to get there, but we know that there might be some indicators that tells us that we're on the right path. Right. And so those indicators will be things like what feedback do we get from customers? How many customers demonstrate a willingness to pay? What's the rate of adoption that they have of a new solution? And so you set up milestones, which is what a VC does, that tells you how close are you coming towards realizing your ambition? I think it's quite interesting the way that some of these sort of ambitions that ventures state are not financial metrics. Let me give you an example, which is Best Buy Health, right? So Best Buy Health has this, which is a fascinating innovation we spent time talking about, where they're trying to help solve the getting more patients out of hospitals quickly to receive care at home is basically their sweet spot. So they're like 5 million patients receiving care at home by 2025. Right? And that tells them the scale of impact they want to have in the world. And that's your feed forward. Your revenue number will come from that. And they've got 500 million of revenue already. Right? The revenue will come from that. But if you get too wedded to a revenue number too quickly, what you do is you'll subject it to error control. Why are you off plan? You don't want to be worried about whether you're off plan early on. You want to know, am I having the impact I want? Because that's the scale of opportunity. Ajay Banger at MasterCard right? Wage a war on cash. Well, that's a pretty compelling ambition. But he also says, I want it by converting some of the 85% at the time he said this, of transactions, which are manual cash transactions to digital. Well, he just created this 
space of possibility. Where am I going to innovate in? And he leads them into new areas of the payments industry that MasterCard weren't previously in. And so by using this feed forward metric, how do we think about the ambition? And then what would give evidence that we're on a path towards that ambition? You're able to make it something that you can manage and that leaders can recognize in the way that they would traditionally manage EBITDA or whatever sales per customer or so on, which which tend to be more for yield or whatever the metric, which is essentially one that they've had lots of history in, they've got lots of performance data on, and so they know if they're off. The trouble with looking to the future is you don't know if you're off unless you give yourself a sense of where you're headed, what success will look like. How do you realize that? Well, I mean, is part of it kind of a management accounting problem? If you think about a startup, right, you give the startup some money, they use the money to go and acquire technology, customers, employees, and so forth. So presumably, you know, if you gave a budget to a corporate explorer, they could use this internal cash, right, to essentially compensate all the other parts of the organization for the resources that they need, right? And then if you had your transfer pricing system and your overhead allocation system set up correctly, then this would be how they could kind of attract stuff. I mean, I've been in organizations where I can spend $1 in one unit and it brings back $5 in the other unit and the project gets canceled because nobody can figure out how to do the transfer pricing. Yeah. And they often set up some form of mechanism for doing some of this. The trouble is that doesn't tackle often one of the key sources of inertia is that which is that the core business doesn't want to give up say manufacturing capacity because they have existing customer commitments so they don't care about a little bit of revenue but it becomes a challenge there's actually one of um, Mike Tushman's colleagues at Harvard who's challenged me in this conversation now about how do we get CFOs to really come on board ask me back in three or four months and we'll see what we come up with because I think it's absolutely critical and yeah, there's a part of the book where I sort of lose it and start really going after CFOs. And it was because I just had a call with one of them and I was so annoyed with what he was saying to me. It's a tough place. Now, I have to say last week I met a CFO who was outstanding. This is um, Phil Donaldson at, at Anderson Corporation, Anderson Windows and Doors. And this is a CFO who totally understands what he needs to do to fund innovation. They've managed to build an ambidextrous unit alongside their traditional business. So they do exist, but they're not evenly distributed, that's for sure. Now, look, you mentioned in the book that there are three general approaches to creating an environment where corporate explorers can thrive. And you talk about the focused, the top down and the bottom up. And I think of like, you know, a bottom up approach is where you just sort of let it be known right? that if somebody has an idea, like here's a roadmap for you to get that idea into the later stages of production and financing. And then the top down is where the leadership decides, hey, here's where we're going to move and we're going to go in this direction and so forth. But the focused approach, or no, actually, I got that wrong. The, the focused approach is where they do that. And then this bottom up is like where you have the lab, the incubator. And I think for the last couple of decades, there's been a trend where companies would set up these labs. I mean, it began with Xerox Park. All the auto companies would open up these labs here in Silicon Valley and so forth. And I think one of the big challenges was always that the labs had trouble convincing the mothership to do anything, right? I had a friend who ran one of these labs and he said it was just impossible. If he didn't spend half his time in flying out to the mothership and working the politics, they couldn't do anything. So is there like an algorithm that will tell us which approach is best? It's one of those sort of research questions that we've looked at. And I think we just describe them a little bit to be formal about this. There's definitely bottom up, as you say, often associated with labs, idea competitions, high participation. And those work occasionally. <laughs> and no question. And I can point to some examples. There's then the top-down, and I was associated with this at IBM, emerging business opportunity program, head of strategy. I'm going to have these six, seven EBOs, he called them, and I'm going to get some funding to get them outside of the existing business management system so that they can develop. And then there are the people like Christian Curtis who just advocate on their own. They bring the idea forward, they get attention, they build it. The interesting thing is that last one, I should say, there's also like venture studios and corporate venture capital. 
I'm not sure they're really the same, but we could talk about them as a route. And they have a role to play, no question. The interesting thing is that most of the examples that we have involve an enormous amount of that last model of the individual focused driving approach. Relatively few come from the other two. Indeed, most people, I was with a company this last week who'd said, yeah, we took all the cases that Tush and O'Reilly gave us about the IBM emerging business opportunities, and it didn't work. And of course, it didn't work because they failed to learn one of the key lessons. This, this is my so what in terms of thinking about what you do in these choices. And the lesson is this, which is that Bruce Harold, who was the head of strategy that I worked for, worked with at IBM, he would get people on his legacy strategy team coming to him and saying, we should codify the process that we're doing. We need to put together a manual so that we teach them how to do this, so that it can be a repeatable process for all of this. And he said, no, I, we will not do that. We will do that in about five, six years' time when we've been successful. We're not doing that at the start. And this is the problem, is that corporations get wrapped up in thinking that the answer is about process, right? I can't tell you how many people ask me, how do you make a repeatable process of this when they haven't even done it once? Have something to repeat, please. And then structure. How do we get the right organization structure around this? Blah, blah. And we miss the importance of the individual with passion to solve a customer problem who is going to find that strong personal motivation. Because whether you're a corporate explorer or an entrepreneur, you are signing up for a world of really hard life, right? This is, my wife was talking about Buddhism over dinner last night. She's a yoga teacher and how Buddhism's fundamental belief is that all life is suffering. Well, you want to be suffering than be a corporate explorer or an entrepreneur, right? It is hard stuff, right? And if you going to live through that, you need passion. You need really be committed to solving the problem that you face. And that's what all of these examples in Corporate Explorer tell you about. And so I think that you can do any of these things. But if you haven't got the passionate individuals leading it, it's not a waste of time. It's not like it won't ha have that value and there'll be examples that disprove me. But on the whole, this is the secret ingredient that corporations miss and need to emphasize. And yeah, you need some process, you need some structure, you certainly need some capability. There's this mar marvelous trilogy that Ryan Buell from Harvard uses to talk about culture, really. And he says, what you need is motivation, license, and capability. And if you can tackle those three things in corporations, regardless of how you pursue it, you'll go a long way. Do you find people with that motivation for a customer problem, solve a customer problem? Do you make sure that they have the basic capabilities, particularly around this notion of experimentation and the lean startup type approaches to, to learn? And then have you given them license? Do they understand that exploring is actually an expectation in this company? And if you've done those three things, you put yourself in a much better place to move forward. Now, look, a lot of the examples of companies that failed to explore and adapt are ones where the leadership simply refused to embrace change. Think about Blockbuster, right? It's, it's an easy story to tell. But when you have other examples like General Electric, where the leadership seemed to be out in front of the rest of the organization advocating change, and it was kind of a spectacular failure, right? What's the problem there? I know some of the characters that you talk about in the book about GE, and I've debated whether to teach GE in my strategy class. You know, there's this wonderful case written by Marco Iancidi from Harvard about GE moving towards the industrial internet. And I used to talk about the industrial internet and how GE gets it and GE understands it. And then the whole thing just blew up. And, and so I don't know whether I should teach that because the case doesn't really give us the gory details of how it got ground into the sand. Yeah, but, you know, but what's the years, right? 2012 is when they start. 2018 is when Jeff Emelt is ousted and Bill Rue leaves and the budget, the strategy is cut, though GE Digital continues to exist. And the case is written in 2014. Yeah. This is a definition of a problem. When you have a Harvard case study written about you declaring victory, when you don't even really know what the market is you're solving or how to meet its needs, 
right? And the industrial internet, I think I've got two projects in it right now. It's still not matured. It's maturing. It's starting to get to the point where we start to see that happening at scale, but it's nowhere near mature. We're a decade later since the case was written, let alone when they started on the strategy. So what they did is they invested well ahead of learning. They moved well before they really understood what they were building, because if they'd waited, they would have learned that this industrial internet of things presents itself differently in each subsector of manufacturing. And you can't have a blanket solution. You need much more custom ways of bringing it to market. Even within the same manufacturing system, you need different approaches. Now, in that sense, it's a case of throwing too many resources at the problem too quickly. It's kind of like SoftBank and WeWork. It is, let's just, if we throw enough money at it, somehow we'll solve the problem. That's a great example. I haven't used that before. That's a great example. Because it's not a corporate thing. It's a human thing, right? We just get to the point where we believe our own whatever so much, and we have enough resources that we're going to throw it at it. And one of those sort of counterintuitive points I would have is that most corporate innovations fail, not because they're under-resourced, but because they're over-resourced too soon, with a lack of commitment to learning. Two years ago, I did a small project for a great startup firm, Taboola, does like media, online media, sales and whatever amazing organization. It's grown in 10 years from no revenue to several billion. And it started in Adam Singola's parents' house. This is a man who is in the Israeli army. He leaves. He's like in his early 30s. And he's back in his childhood bedroom starting a venture, right? And then a few years later, he's got a multi-billion dollar corporation. How many corporate explorers are willing to do that? No, they want a nice office. They want their own office, maybe with a bean bag and a few um, football tables, please, because that's what a startup does. I think the meaning of lean, of I'm going to be skinny in my resources, is something that corporate explorers, the best ones, really get and internalize, because out of that scarcity comes ingenuity, comes commitment, and that ability to de-risk without committing resources, as long as it's associated with discipline. Right, Because I think in a corporate world, you do still need discipline, feed-forward metrics, experimentation methods, but not too much resource. Not too much resource. Yeah, I also teach a course on the wine industry, and we like to say that the best wine comes from the vines that suffer. That's right. Oh, I like that. I like that analogy. That speaks to my interests as well. Well, last question. I talk to a lot of professors of strategy and innovation, and they've got wonderful things to say about various companies and startups. But whenever I turn the focus to universities, they just throw up their hands and say, well, okay, I got nothing to say on that. And my experience at universities is that like no one ever gets fired for saying no. That's, it's extreme. On the one hand, it's so decentralized that you can innovate and hope that if no one notices, you can build it to something and it gets to a point where it can't be killed. But if you're trying to work through official channels and do something that's innovative, it's almost impossible, right? Do you think that for those kinds of nonprofits or ones that aren't facing this high level of competition? Is there a separate set of rules? As an outsider, someone who's not in a university, can you as an ex-anthropologist offer up some insight that the professors don't have? To be honest, one of the interesting things is that I mentioned Bruce Harold, and Bruce went on to be president of the University of Iowa. And he left a few years later. And I don't think he had the same scale of success. I think there are social networks which are really tough to move through. I have a great friend who is both an academic and practitioner in sustainability and environment, and he works through the United Nations, right? That's bureaucracy on steroids and politics on steroids. There are definitely environments where this is too hard. But I will say this, some of these organizations where great things happen are our best stereotypes for hierarchical slow, old-fashioned organizations. I mentioned Unica Insurance. Unica is a 200-year-old company founded in Vienna when Beethoven was still there writing symphonies, right? If they can do it, so can you. Well, Andrew, this has been great chatting. I really appreciate it. The book is Corporate Explorer. There's also a bunch of wonderful articles in California Management Review, Harvard Business Review. And of course, there's going to be the companion volume to Corporate Explorer, Check out our new article in the Sloan Management Review on Best Buy, scaling Best Buy. And then Corporate Explorer Fieldbook launches August 29th. 
another level of practical detail about how you get this done in cycle operations. Great. I look forward to it and look forward to chatting again. Thank you for the invitation, Greg. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 